Coach Ange, and I am here with Sam Yukta for season two episode of A Little Perspective. And here at A Little Perspective, we like to shine a light of awareness on different conditions, disabilities, situations, and humans. So we are excited to have Shannon Adams on with us today to talk about Crohn's disease. Sam Yukta, how are you this morning? I'm doing really great. Angela, thanks for asking. Excited to share another story of an, a wonderful guest today. Uh, her name is Shannon Adams. She is originally from Newton Square, Pennsylvania, but currently lives in Brookfield, Illinois. She is a music teacher, and like Angela said, she is living with Crohn's disease and rheumatoid arthritis and heads. Could you, uh, Shannon, could you say hello and introduce yourself to everybody? Yeah, hi, um, I'm Shannon, as was already said. Um, I live in the Chicago area. I am a music teacher and I perform. Um, I perform with a trio, which is actually really cool. I play, I play the piano and I sing and I have a cello player and we have a cajon player. Um, cajon is like a, if you don't know what it is, it's a box drum that you sit on and he plays underneath. And then he's got like a hi hat and a tambourine. He's got a tambourine on his feet, so that's pretty cool. We have a lot of fun doing that. Um, I also teach piano and voice lessons out of my home. Um, during the pandemic, I obviously wasn't teaching a lot of in-person lessons, so now I do Zoom lessons. <laughs> so you don't necessarily have to live like close to do lessons. Um, I do have Crohn's disease. I have Crohn's disease and um, it's actually HEDS. It's a uh, hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Um, I also have rheumatoid arthritis. And then with like the EDS, there's so many things that go along with it. Um, I actually wasn't diagnosed with EDS until I was like 30, but it is, it's genetic. My daughter has it. My sister has it. Um, we're pretty sure my mom has it and it's it's a lifelong thing but I was the first one to be diagnosed so then after that it was kind of like a, a ball really. um I also have two kids I have a four and a half year old daughter who is insanely smart and um she's also very musical and she's good at art and everything uh and my son is 10 months old he's He's the baby. He loves his big sister and he's just starting to like really move around and be fun, you know, play and copy. So we're having a good time. That is awesome. That is awesome. So heads is, or EDS is um, connective tissue disorder, right? So it's mm -hmm. um, yeah. it, hyperflexibility. Is that an accurate description? Hypermobile, yeah. It's the, yeah. It's the same thing. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's actually, it seems like it might be underdiagnosed because um, it kind of gets dismissed and like a lot of the, a lot of the comorbidities that come with it can be other things. So like, I've always had GI issues, but I didn't always have Crohn's disease. I have, my family's fun. I got the autoimmune disease on one side and the connective <laughs> tissue on the other side. I got all of it. Your definition <laughs> um, of fun is a little bit twisted. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My husband tells me, because I'm the oldest, he's like, you're the beta copy. You got everything. <laughs> That's good. That's a good one. Yeah. Um, so it like, like I always had, my mom said from the day I was born, I had GI issues. I had hip dysplasia, which is the like, it, that's another red flag, but you don't necessarily have to have EDS. Like I was in a brace. They weren't sure I was going to walk. Um, my mom said I walked like the day before my appointment to talk about surgery oh. and they were so happy yeah I was I think I was 15 months um my daughter she didn't have the hip dysplasia that they noticed like my my legs were like you know twirling in circles she didn't have that um, but she started like having some subluxing which is like partial dislocations and um so we're trying to help her because I didn't have that we didn't know I wasn't diagnosed till I was older so with her we're trying to get her tools as she gets older it's interesting to me as a as a woman with achondroplasia because achondroplasia is a cartilage to bone 
issue. And mm-hmm. then I think of my friends with OI who have brittle bone. And then, you know, I see the connection with that. I don't know. I just think it's neat that there's that crossover, but yet like ED, it's not a dwarfism condition, you know, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. maybe that's just my head. I think that's neat. So um, yeah, there's also like, there's a ton of, I think there's like 12 or 13 different types of EDS um, and hypermobile is the most common and it's, it's the only one that they don't know the gene for. <laughs> so there is a lot of research being done about that to see if they can figure out the specific gene to identify the hypermobile type. Thanks for sharing that. That's um, very interesting. And I, like, again, thank you for correcting and because I was you know, I was seeing his heads, but it's, yes, so that is it, so that is good to know. Um, so one thing that we share in common, ex- well, another thing that we share in common besides living in the Chicago area is that I played piano. You know, growing oh, yeah. up, you know, I took lessons and I taught for a few years. And um, you know, having you know physical disability, having dwarfism, there is you know limitations on you know playing instruments and like what we're able to you know do, and especially if there's with, you know, reaching the keys, you know, how far we could go. And, but I, you know, piano was such like a big, so integral, you know, growing up, you know, with my confidence and just like with the discipline just like learning the art and just feeling like it was such a big part of my identity. So I wanted to, thought we could hear from you as far as like, could you talk about your journey in music and playing, in playing piano, you know, voice and how it impacted your life living with, you know, chronic illness and um, where you are today. Yeah, I mean, that's awesome that you play. Do you still play now, like for yourself or anything? Uh, not really, to be honest. I did teach for a few years, like after, yeah. um, for a little bit, but I think just moving, you know, focusing on my career and to be honest, yeah. I still, I, I have, I have the piano in my garage. I, <laughs> but <play. laughs> I, I should, I really should, <laughs> but it's just, it's, um, but, but it's something that you never leaves you, you know, like even if you don't, um, when you get art playing as often, it's that, that art you never forget. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm happy to talk about it. Music is like, it's what I do. Um, I started playing when I was maybe six or seven. Um, and I've been playing ever since then. I, I didn't really have a ton of issues with it when I was younger. I mean, now I know, like, I used to get yelled at because my, I don't know if you, my fingertips we're not always as firm as they need it to be. And I was like, I don't know. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. It's because my fingers are hypermobile. So they have a tendency to like bend backwards. So now I, I know that's why I was getting correct, <laughs> but I couldn't like, you don't have my, I think it's helped my strength a lot. And I am hopeful that it'll help my daughter. So like some people's fingers, you know, bend straight back mine bend, but they're not, um, Like I can hold my hand shape on the piano. Um, So that's kind of cool. I think it's helped a lot. Um, I went to New York University for vocal performance. Um, I actually didn't sing until I was in about middle school. We moved and my mom wanted us to audition for the play, my sister and I, because she's like all the parents told her that's what everybody does. So we should do the play and that's how we'll make friends. And we both were, I was kind of like, this is dumb. (laughs) I don't want to sing. I'm a classical musician. I play the piano. Um, And then I sang for the audition and everybody's like, wow, you're really good. So of course, being a middle schooler and having that made me like, oh, maybe I should sing. (laughs) If I'm good at it, maybe I should keep going. Um, So that kind of like gave me the love for musical theater. And then that's what I went to school for. Um, NYU has kind of a weird role that I don't, I don't remember if it's a New York rule or an NYU rule. Um, you can't double major in something that has the same core classes. So I couldn't be a piano and voice major and I chose voice, um, which I'm really glad I did. Their voice program was awesome. But I did like, I got to, I took lessons with a piano professor and I was an accompanist and I got to do all that kind of stuff there. Um, one thing as far as like my professional journey that I have noticed, especially with the chronic disease, um, it's really well managed at the moment, but I was starting to have issues in high school and I was diagnosed in college. Um, and I started having a lot of issues 
and like I, ha I had to be open with my program that I was sick um and I feel like that kind of took away some opportunities because they were afraid that I wouldn't be up for what I was doing even though there was I was the lead in a show and I had to have a colonoscopy <laughs> I went I went home to get the colonoscopy and I came back the same day for her do you want to say something Sorry, this is my daughter. She was bringing me. <laughs> this is Nora. Ah! <laughs> You're on video. <laughs> is that your art? Down. Is that your art on the oh, wall? Yeah. Nora, is this is this your art on the wall? Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. <laughs> Sorry. No, you're fine. Yeah, we um. I, I taught preschool for a couple of years. So with the pandemic, um, my daughter and I are very similar. I have ADHD and we think maybe she does too. And like she needed a schedule. So this is, it's everywhere. It's, I'm in the dining room. It's on all of the walls. We did preschool. <laughs> um, but back to the, the music stuff, you know, I tend to Okay, okay, come here. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sure you understand. Come here, Nora. I'll open it. Yeah, so um, Shannon and I are in a parenting while disabled group together. So mm -hmm. um, it's kind of suiting <laughs> that she, she's here, you know. Um, and, and that is something I want to touch on too when you're when you're done talking about um, your journey. Mm -hmm. uh, for sure, for sure. Um, you know, you were you were saying that you you were hesitant to tell them, but then you kind of had to, and you really do feel like it affected some of your, you know, opportunities. Um, do you do you feel like um, that had anything to do with your, you know, want for advocacy and um, and growth mm -hmm. in that area? Yeah, I do. I really want to like. I want to showcase that, you know, just because I have some issues doesn't mean that I I can't do it. And you mentioned bragging, like I'm a really good accompanist. <laughs> That's my, I love singing. I I have voice students. I have one who's a freshman at um, Berkeley School of Music right now. Um, I have a student who got into AMDA, the, it's the American Music and Dance Academy. So like, I, I, I know what I'm doing, I can do it. Um, and the, I didn't tell my trio until I was in the hospital. I was hospitalized with E. coli in 2019, like right before the pandemic hit. Yeah, it was terrible. That was like the worst thing <laughs> ever that I had. But because of the Crohn's, I couldn't, I can't like handle it by myself. So I had to be hospitalized. Um, and then I had to tell them because I had to cancel the show. Um, and they were like, you know, why didn't you tell me we would treat you the same way? And I was like, but you don't know that. Like if I was upfront about that in the beginning, I'm not sure that they would have trusted me as much. But, but I think that actually was kind of a good thing because they had to use another accompanist last minute. And then, <laughs> then my child player was like, never again. They missed you. <laughs> they missed you dearly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think yeah. the key takeaway for this, because this actually came up in the last conversation we had. Uh, and it comes up often of the hesitancy to share, to disclose because of the fear of discrimination. Um, and, and actually, um, Klua, when we, we talked about ableism uh, in a previous interview, and she, the way that she described ableism is just simply that it's discrimination in sheep's clothing. And I was like, holy cow, yes, that's like such a great way to, to put it. And I think that if the world would just listen to us about us mm -hmm. then then all of that would be resolved because we all are capable of self-reporting we're all like like you you said like I'm capable of saying hey can't do this but I can do this like don't assume what I can't do just because I've let you know that there are things I can't do like let me mm -hmm. make that decision don't make that decision for me and so I yeah, think and I don't think like, oh, sorry. I don't think in my experience, like it's not meant to be malicious. Like I loved my program and it just, they just don't even think about it. It's just, it's ingrained. 
Exactly. It's, it's um, implicit for sure. And, and like you said, it's, it's often well-intended. They don't want to mm -hmm. put you in a different, a difficult spot or also conversations are difficult for people. And it's funny because like, it can even be difficult for a disabled person to talk about their disability. So I understand why it would be difficult for, you know, someone who may not understand the condition to, to have the conversation because they don't want to make you uncomfortable and then it makes them mm -hmm. uncomfortable because da, 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 da. and so I think just really I would love the takeaway of this little piece to just be please communicate and don't mm -hmm. make assumptions for you know someone with a disability so uh, I'm, I love that you shared that so thank you so much mm -hmm. um, I wanted to know I have a question you talked about, when you talked about piano playing, you talked about the finger mobility. And I know that you ha also have uh, arthritis. So are, mm -hmm. are the two connected? Is the EDS connected to the arthritis or you just are, as you said, lucky? I, yeah, I'm just lucky. Um, no, because I have rheumatoid arthritis. It's more likely connected to the Crohn's. Um, I actually, it was hard because uh, like I've always had joint issues and, you know, there's the joint issues and pain that come with the hypermobility. And then there's, you can have joint swelling and pain with Crohn's disease. And in the past, um, like my knees and my one elbow, when they start hurting, usually I was like, oh, I'm going to have a Crohn's flare. And that's, that's like one of my first signs. Um, but then they started hurting independently and my fingers started swelling which I had never had and I actually like remember the incident where I was like maybe I should go to the doctor <laughs> because I had um I tried to mow the lawn <laughs> and I uh, my hands hurt so badly for the next couple of days and they were like they were super swollen um so I went to my rheumatologist who was the one that diagnosed the EDS uh and she was like, okay, you know, we'll do some blood work. I doubt it's rheumatoid arthritis, but, but let's see. She's good. She just was saying, you know, I shouldn't worry about that. Um, and then it came back and I was actually at a, uh, my GI doctor when she called and she was like, you have rheumatoid arthritis. <laughs> so he, they worked together and he was able to put me on some um, meds for that right away that also with Crohn's. Um, and I mean, it is hard when I have a flare up, the, the swelling for that, like makes it kind of stiff. Um, so it's frustrating if I'm having a flare up and I want to play something fast and my fingers just are not doing what I want them to do. Um, and when I talked to my GI doctor, we think that maybe I had it for a few years and we didn't know because a lot of, I take biologics and a lot of the biologics cross over and treat a lot of different autoimmune diseases. So all of the ones that I had been on before treated Crohn's disease and arthritis. Um, but after I had my daughter, I had a big flare and I needed a new medication. I take Stellara uh, and it doesn't treat rheumatoid arthritis. <laughs> so after six months or so, I started having those symptoms. And then that kind of, you know, we had to get, now I have to take additional meds because um, the Stellara is working, but we had no idea. Could you talk about um, what accommodations that you've had to request over the years as far as like, like, like when starting a new job or if you have a, or what we could tell the viewers, if I have a friend, you know, with Crohn's disease, how can we be more accommodating to them? Like what, what can we do to make sure they got, they have everything they need? Uh, honestly, with the Crohn's, I tried to just hide it. <laughs> um, I didn't have... I've started having more mobility issues recently, um, but I didn't have a lot of mobility issues when I was younger. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I didn't really ask for accommodations. I learned kind of the hard way that I can't handle a full-time job um, when I was teaching preschool because I was having lots of flare-ups and I was getting sick and like, they let me obviously go to the doctor, but it was clear that like they were annoyed that I had to keep you know that I was hospitalized or and I started that job when I moved to Illinois so like I, a lot of people with Crohn's disease specifically I'm sure know that traveling and like moving and stress can just make it worse um 
So I had several hospitalizations in my first year here. Um, not all necessarily Crohn's disease, but my body just like, it could, I couldn't handle it. Um, now I tend to be more open with it. Um, I still kind of try to keep the Crohn's to myself until people know me. My, um, my strategy now has kind of been to like slowly tell people <laughs> or, you know, tell them if uh, something if something happens, then I tell them and then they know. Um, I, I know that it's not the best strategy, but with my profession, it kind of has been the most beneficial for me, unfortunately, um, because then they know what I can do before I have an issue and then they want to keep me. Um, in college though, I did have, I started to get really sick. I think it was sophomore year. Um, and the voice, the music program is very, um, is very strict. It's like a conservatory style program. Um, so I had 18 credits and 18 credits for the music program is very different than 18 credits for something else because you they had to fit in a ton of classes. So every class was one or two credits. So I had a ton of classes and I had to um, cut back and NYU has a center for disabilities. I graduated 10 years ago, so I don't remember what it was called. <laughs> Um, but they, I worked with them and they helped me cut my load to 12 credits. I think I did that for one or two semesters and they would send letters to my teachers, um, just letting them know, like if I had to leave suddenly or if I was out for a few days, like, please don't penalize me. Um, but again, like I do think for the performance teachers that kind of hindered me a little bit because then everyone knew. Yeah. Yeah, um, we have a friend, Lauren Bryant, she has OI and she is finishing her master's and um, she wants to do um, disability administrative work in the collegiate atmosphere. And I just, uh, like that just makes my heart flutter because, it, or, you know, just skip a beat, just to think about the, the empowerment that an awareness that she will bring to to the school. So I'm glad that you had that opportunity 10 years ago. And so of course now it's mm -hmm. it's even better. Um, that I I mean I completely and like again I get why you would hesitate to to tell anyone for sure. Um, and it stinks because you know the the way we can advocate is by telling people. Um, but, mm -hmm. you know, I completely get it. It's such a double-edged sword for sure. Um, mm -hmm. tell us, tell us a little bit about the, um, Facebook group that you started, um, for people in your area. I have run a few Facebook yeah. groups and it is not easy. So tell us a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, I would love to. I, I mean, any advice or help would be good because I just started it. Um, we have like 20 people and I would really like to expand it. Um, so I kind of came up with the idea because I, I need help. We don't have any family out here. Um, all of our family lives in the Philadelphia area and they come out pretty often, but it's still you know, I can't just make a phone call and have somebody come over and help me out for an hour or two. Um, so I was looking for like a mother's helper and, you know, help cleaning and stuff because I have two little kids and I'm tired. Plus I have been having the mobility issues. Um, and I, my Crohn's is good, but it's just like, it's fatiguing. And I have had a little bit of extra fatigue recently so I would love help like cleaning and stuff and there's I don't I don't know what other people's experience is but I feel like it's really hard to find things that are affordable um or can aid people with disabilities like I don't need somebody to come take care of me every day but I could use somebody to watch the kids while I clean or you know, something like that during the week. So not, I don't have to do everything on the weekend. Um, so my idea was to kind of exchange services. That's why I changed it to um, the service exchange for people with disabilities in Chicago, like the whole area, um, instead of just the suburbs. Um, 
just kind of my idea is like if I I can offer to help you clean your bathroom one day and you know maybe you can come and help me clean my kitchen or if you want to take piano lessons and it's not really in your budget I can offer some piano lessons and maybe you can come watch my kids for an hour or two while I get stuff done just that kind of thing um I want it to build like a supportive community in the area so we can help each other and make our own help that's such a great idea like it, it makes so much sense um i've really started to so i live on the gulf coast in mississippi um have my entire life um growing up swore i would leave and never come back and i'm here i'm 40 mm -hmm. and i have no desire to go anywhere else because i have built a village where if I do need someone to come help me clean my bathroom, you know, I could get somebody to do that. And so I completely understand the value of the village. And I think that our ancestors had, you know, had it right when, because it mm -hmm. takes a village, it truly does. And I, I hope that that, I hope that that takes off for you. Um, hopefully this will be a little bit of exposure. We'll put the link in the comments. Um, because yeah, I think that's, I think it's a great, I think it's a great idea. I think that it's a really great um, piece of advocacy because you are, you know, not allowing your disability to keep you down. You are finding a solution. Um, I just love it. I really do that. Kudos to you. Um, I'm happy to, yeah. to give you any help with building a group um, so we can talk offline mm -hmm. about that, but um, it, it's a lot yeah, to manage, you. but you're that group. It, will have such a strong purpose if you could get it off the ground. So kudos, mm -hmm. kudos, kudos to you for sure. Thank awesome. you. Sam, you could, do you have any other questions? Man, this has been such yeah. a great conversation. Mm -hmm. Yes, I am learning a lot, you know, just like by, by listening to you and just like sharing your story. And like, this is really, this is a very needed conversation, especially with like the group that you're like, you're managing and just how important just, you know, people with disabilities need to get the services that they need, you know, mm -hmm. and it's, and just by really creating that and having the foundation for that, like, I really wish you the best with that. And like, I, I'm, I'm sure Angela will give you all the tools you need to, um, to expand it and to, you know, get it, get it going. Um, in your bio, like you talk about um, the concept of visible disabilities versus invisible disabilities and in this day and age still you know even though we're like we're the 21st century there is this misconception that if someone has a disability it's always visible mm -hmm. um can you talk about that like can you talk about how we can you know really eliminate that misconception and like how the concept of visible and invisible disability mm -hmm. yeah so i actually feel like now i'm kind of on both sides because I always had the GI issues and I had the Crohn's and stuff, but you can't really see that. I mean, you can see if I lost 30 pounds, but no one knew why. Um, and it just like, because I look young and healthy and um, it's just assumed that I'm fine. And I feel like people get annoyed if you, like I, I have really learned how to limit myself and pace myself so I can do what I want to do. Um, and people get frustrated with that because they're like, you know, you're, you're young. Why can't you do all of these things? Um, and then as far as the visible side, I just got my handicap parking pass yesterday <laughs> and I used it for the first time. Um, which is amazing. And I don't really, I don't need it all the time, but recently I needed it because I need my crutches to walk around with. And I I feel like if I was having a Crohn's flare or something and didn't necessarily need my crutches, like if I got out of the car and I didn't have any sort of mobility aid with me, like people would, they would say something. Um, and I, I know other people have had that experience too. And it's just, if I'm parking there, it's for a reason. You know, it shouldn't be policed. So. It's so strange to me that people think that we would exaggerate a disability for a 
parking space, you know, like it's just kind of silly when you really think about it. Um, Mm -hmm. But people are so worried that somebody's getting something that they don't deserve, even if it is a parking space that they don't even consider that you're, you're talking or thinking about a human, like this is a human Mm -hmm. and they have a disability. They're already, you know, struggling with something just let them have the Mm -hmm. daggum space, you know? And then another thing that you said with like the crutches, um, you know, we, we see in our uh, community, a lot of little people will use a scooter because, you know, it's just Mm -hmm. a lot of reasons. And, Mm -hmm. and so, you know, it's not either, or like, it's not that you're Mm -hmm. wheelchair bound or normal. It's, you know, there Mm -hmm. are different things and the same person can experience different things like within a small period of time like they can need a wheelchair one day and be able to walk the next it's Mm -hmm. not a matter of faking or powering through or anything like that and and so I think kind of like the listen to us you know point that we had earlier again like just listen to us and believe us about us you know believe us about Mm -hmm. us because we're not we're not faking it. And and then I think yeah. with um, autoimmune diseases, there tends to be a, a big stigma with that as well, where, you know, um, is it in your head or, um, you know, are you really that always, tired? Like I always, <laughs> yeah. I always doubt myself. I'm like, maybe I don't have Crohn's disease. I still, and my husband is like, you have it. <laughs> yeah. But that's just, that's the the societal you know impression that 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 they put on you and and you don't want to have it either. that's another thing like nobody wants to have a condition so you know it's um this conversation has been really lovely just from different topics and and you're sharing so openly so we really appreciate that um now if anybody wants to take lessons from you or connect with you what is the best way for them to to do so um i have a website let's see which i just renewed and i need to look up the uh domain <laughs> i can't remember if it if i did shannon yeah i'm sorry let's see um, that's the best way to contact me. I check my email pretty regularly. Okay. Well, we'll put all of that in, in the comments and in the notes. <clears throat> and so they can be adamsmusic.com. Shannon B. Adams music.com. B. Adams. But yeah, I'll send it. Yeah. Um, awesome. I do lessons. I do weddings. I can do it with my trio. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll send you, I'll send you a message with the info. Um, that actually reminded me, um, I had to play for a wedding last week and I mentioned I've been using my crutches and I like, I haven't always had to, so I didn't think about loading or anything. Um, and this was actually like a big kind of light bulb and now I know I need to ask, but I was by myself, usually my two other trio mates help me. Um, luckily I didn't have to carry, I have a full 88 keyboard piano and sound equipment that I bring. Um, they had a piano, so I didn't need it, but it was in a room in a hotel and I, I parked in the front. There wasn't a, there was only valet parking and there wasn't, um, a parking lot that was like right there. And when I walked down with my stuff, I walked like it was really far to get to the room. Um, and I got there and I was like, I can't, I had just, you know, parked my car with the hazards and I was like, I can't go back there and get my car and then come back. Like, I'm not going to make it. Um, yeah. so I had to I was asking around and I found the venue manager for the wedding and I explained my situation to her and she was lucky enough to, or I was lucky enough that she said, you know, I don't know if you want me to, but if you give me your keys, I can, um, I can drive it around. There was a load in spot in the kitchen, like right behind the kitchen. And nobody told me that. Mm-hmm. And I, I hadn't thought to ask. And yeah. originally she was like, you can go walk back and get your car and put it behind the kitchen. And I told her, I, I don't think I can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. again, I didn't have my purchase with me and 
I had, you know, I had my bag and everything. So I look fine. Yeah. Um, so I could see the kind of a little bit of like the, you know, are you just being lazy? Right. But she did, she did do it and it was really nice and it made a huge difference. But that's something that I haven't really thought about with performing in venues. And I, I know that like the venues don't think about having disabled performers. Right. Right. So, yeah. I, I recently had a similar situation too, where um, I was chair of uh, an award ceremony down here, Woman of Achievement. And I didn't think about having to speak at a podium. And um, so I didn't have a, a proper step stool. And so we had to yeah. finagle a, a, you know, a step stool and it was mm -hmm. not right. And then no. so that was like, okay, lesson learned, right? And so then mm -hmm. um, two nights ago, I, I'm co-chair for Shut Cancer. And so two nights ago, I, I actually was in the same venue, but I remembered mm -hmm. the step stool and it made all the difference, you know? So yeah. because they don't, people don't think about it and it's not you know, it's not, again, it's not that they are intentionally not thinking about it. They just don't yeah. think about it. So um, again, thank you so much, Shannon, for all yeah. of your time and this amazing conversation. We will put all of your information below. Um, and if you're in the Chicago area, um, join her group because that is such a great idea. I just love it so much. I hope that takes off. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you, Sam Yukta, as always, and I love thank all you. of you, and I hope y'all have the best day. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.